He's an ESPN baseball analyst. He won the Cy Young back in 1984, and boy, does he remind you all the time about that. He's Rick Sutcliffe, <laughs> who joins us on loan for the Mothership, in, uh, on the call for the Braves-Mets on ESPN Friday at 4 Eastern. And, uh, well, you got some uh, company there. Uh, Rick, who do you have? Dano, I thought you might want to meet an Oriole fan. Oh, that's the Oriole fan. We've been looking for. <laughs> we found the Oriole fan, and that's a great hat. Thank you. What's going on, buddy? Is this uh, your grandson? It is. This is my grandson, Ryder. Um, as you know, the Little League baseball got canceled. Um, so he's really excited about opening day, and he just wanted to say hello and now he's off to camp for golf school. All right. See you, Ryder. See ya. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> hey, before we get started. Uh-oh. Um, Uh-oh. Yeah, I, I, need, I need our boy Todd Fritz to apologize, Dan. To you? Yeah. Oh. Um, okay. Yesterday he sent me a text wanting to know if opening day I was going to be on ESPN or ESPN radio. Dan, this is 24 years with ESPN. Um, I don't do radio. People that look like you and, and Boog Shambi <laughs> and others, um, you know, as you got older, ESPN said, hey, this sports center thing, uh, it just doesn't look the same. Um, so I, I, if Todd will apologize, I, I'll move on with the show. Well, wait a minute. Then you have to apologize to me because you just kind of called me ugly and that I have a face for radio there. So, Todd, you don't have to apologize. I feel like I do. No. The guy's a would... rookie of the year, a Cy Young no. winner. I know he took a shot at you. Uh, who But cares? he feels like I dissed him because I just wanted to make sure for your notes that it was an ESPN, not you know, ESPN radio broadcast. Hey, Dan, as, as I look at you, I think about one of the first interviews I did for ESPN. It was with Mike Piazza. And I'm sitting there, and Mike and I had gotten close on the Nike baseball trip. And he started ragging on me a little bit. And I said, hey, you better back off. I go. I broke my rule of thumb doing this interview with you. And he goes, what's your rule? And I go, I don't normally interview people better looking than me. <laughs> and he goes, who do you talk to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a short list of those guys that you can't interview. Yeah, that got me off to a great start. Like <laughs> when you um, came on Sports Center after an opening day, um, I had retired. A bunch of my friends um, had wanted to go to opening day and sit in the bleachers at Wrigley. So we did. And that was the year Ryan Sandberg came out of retirement. And you might remember this, Dan, but we go over to Murphy's Bleacher Bar after the game. We're all partying and everything. And they holiday. They go, hey, Sports Center starting off at Wrigley Field. We run back in. And there you are showing the highlights. Sandberg hitting a double in the gap. And your comment was two former Cub greats returned to Wrigley. Sandberg hitting a double. And me with a beer that was about that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you didn't get cheated across the street from Wrigley, did you? Do you, do you have? Did, not, did you ever pay a tab at Murphy's? No, I didn't never did. So. I didn't and so. as you know, um, Jim Murphy gave me the apartment upstairs, um, and it all came about because towards the end of '84, the Cubs were going crazy. After a game, I just wanted to go have a beer somewhere. And the clubhouse kid and I tried to walk across the street. And the, the, the city was so cub crazy at that time that I couldn't even get into the bar. And the following day, Jim Murphy, a former Chicago policeman, was waiting on me. And he said, please give me another chance. And he moved all of the liquor from up on the second floor. <laughs> uh, he created an apartment. He gave it to me. And as you remember, um, during the World Series, um, you know, a couple of those parties were, were as good as it gets. I, I saw or heard where Mark Grace took a shot at you during a Diamondbacks uh, broadcast. Uh, did you yeah. get, did you get word of what your former teammate had to say? Oh, did I get word? Um, you know, in the past, it would have been like a phone call. But with, with this Twitter thing now, um, it just went crazy. Gracie, we love him, right? Yeah. I mean, he's one of our favorites. Yeah, he, You know that he's like a son to me. Uh, yesterday... <laughs> on the Marquee Sports Network, the, the new Cubs channel, somebody hit a long home run. I haven't seen it yet. I've just heard. And Gracie goes, wow, that reminds me of some of them that Sutcliffe used to give up. <laughs> yeah. Who hit the yeah. deepest home run off of you? You know, the longest probably, I mean, it was during spring training, but there were two of them. One, Dave Kingman hit one down in St. Pete in that ballpark. That was actually, we don't know if it was fair or foul. It landed in the water, which is like maybe 600 feet away. 
The one that I remember <laughs> you say was the Shea Stadium back when it was Shea. Kevin McReynolds hit a bomb off the facing of the upper deck. <laughs> and the ball hit so hard that it bounced back, and our shortstop, Sean Dunstan, picked it up. <laughs> and for some reason, I'd never done this, but when he hit it, I screamed. I went, whoa! <laughs> like, I couldn't believe it. And as I turned back to look at home, I thought he'd be standing there watching it. No, nah, he was ha- he was almost a second base like it was no big deal. We're talking to Rick Sutcliffe. Uh, he'll be on the call Braves-Mets on Friday at 4 Eastern. Uh, what's what's baseball going to do with the Blue Jays here, son? I, I, you know, they're supposed to know before the first pitch is thrown. Um, you would have thought, Dan, and I know you've probably talked about this, that that was the ideal situation to uh, – social distance and, 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 and kind of keep people away with the hotel that they have there and everything going on. Um, it's just a, it's a different day and age. I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I will tell you this. Um, I, I'm about as excited to do a baseball game tomorrow, maybe as I've ever been. Um, as you know, I was blessed to be a part of nine opening days. Um, this one's different, but I tell you what, I, I, I go back, a month ago to watching live golf on TV. I I didn't tape it. I watched it live all four days. It was, it was so exciting to have something, a sporting event. I didn't know the outcome to. Um, I know that it's going to be different. I know that that you're not going to have a crowd. The noise when we did that summer camp game on Sunday with the Cubs and the White Sox was, was kind of weird. Uh, but I'm excited. I, I'm, I'm thrilled that baseball is trying to come back. Yeah, I'm, I'm watching the broadcast and uh, the Cubs and the White Sox, and I, I'm okay if there's – I don't want crowd noise pumped in. But, if I mean, if it's going to be, then fine. What is the, What are ESPN's plans with throwing in some crowd noise there? That's a great question. Um, you know, we've got a big meeting in the morning to go over a lot of that. Um, talking with a lot of the players, particularly with the Cubs, um, after the game, on Sunday, there's a lot of players that want that crowd noise. And I'll tell you the main reason that, that, that I think of, Dan, you know how, you know, a pitcher will knock a guy down. And you know what that dugout's like. There'll be people chirping. Yeah. They'll be, hey, you know, hey, knock me down, or whatever they might say. Well, you could say that in the past because nobody could hear you. Now they're going to hear everything that you say. I, I just think that, um, you know, the number one thing that the crowd did was it took that self-motivating factor out of it. Um, showing up every day at Wrigley Field um, was easy to go out there and, and leave everything on the field. I go back to before I got traded to the Cubs when I played for Cleveland. Uh, there were a lot of times that literally uh, you could hear the guy banging on the drum. You could hear the announcers and what they were saying. Um, you know, I, I know what it's like to play in an empty stadium. Um, and as you remember, we've talked about it Um <laughs> playing for the, the the Indians back in the early 80s is where the movie Major League came from. Uh, there's a lot of truth to what goes on in that story. You're not portrayed in that movie, are you? Um, you know what? I'm not. Um, um, I, I was not the wild thing. Um, you know, Mitch Williams came along after that. I might have been that crafty old guy that had vast... <laughs> 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 did, you, <laughs> did you ever... What, what, did you ever load up a pitch? I never loaded up a pitch. Um, I will tell you this, though. You you watch these guys now, and a guy will hit a fly ball or hit a ground ball, and it'll come back, and the pitcher will look at it, and it'll have a scuff on it, and they throw it out. Dan, I would still be pitching today if I (laughs) had a baseball with a scuff on it. You know what it's like. You put that scuff on this side, it's going to take off that way. You do it the other way. Um, I got a lot of outs on baseballs that had scuffs on them. I never scuffed it, but I knew what to do when I had one. What do you think of the Mookie Betts deal with the Dodgers? From the Dodgers' perspective, is this is this a great deal? It's a great deal, um, and it's a great deal for a lot of reasons. And the number one for me is then the type of person that, that Mookie is, um, that contagious joy that he brings to the ballpark every night. Um, he's one of those guys that doesn't have to get a hit to be the MVP of the game. Um, I never – saw anybody play right field at Fenway Park like like he's done. Uh, it doesn't matter where you put him. Uh, I applaud what Andrew Friedman has done there. You know, there's been a lot of guys. He didn't go out and get a lot of the other guys. He, you know, he could have had Harper or Machado. They had the money to go get everybody. I think he found the perfect fit to fit into that ball club. And when you think about how long he's going to be there, 
we could be talking about multiple championships. Now you're going to do the the Braves Mets, but you're going to do that from home. Yes. Yeah. Just the yeah. communication and the rapport. And I know you're working with people you work with before, but just trying not to step on each other during a broadcast has to be pretty challenging. I'll be honest with you. I, I don't think we have that figured out yet. Um, I, I think that is going to be the number one issue. Um, I have worked with Boog Shambi forever. Um, we've never worked with Chipper Jones before. This is the first year that Chipper uh, will be doing this. There will be some times, I'm sure, when, when we walk on each other, and we'll continue to try – to get better at that. But I'll just give you one situation. You were listening. We did the White Sox uh, Cub game on Sunday. We had Anthony Rizzo on for an inning. And stuff that Chipper Jones is going to bring to our telecast that nobody else has probably ever brought. <clears throat> Anthony Rizzo talking about in Miami going down, sneaking down with his dad to the third base uh, 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 side to yell, Larry, Larry, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> and then years later, Rizzo's playing first base for the Padres. Chipper gets a single. They're standing there. And, and Rizzo's just looking at him, laughing. And Chipper, like, you know, Chipper's telling the story. Rizzo's telling the story. He's laughing. And Rizzo tells him while he's on first base what he and his dad used to do. <laughs> I mean, it's inside things like that that uh, I'm really excited about, uh, you know, being with Chipper for, for this. Even though it's 60 games, I'm excited to have an opportunity to do that. It's uh, pretty amazing to see the, the bookshelf. You know, a lot of people come on and uh, they got all kinds of trophies. And, uh, but you're a minimalist. You, you don't have any of your, your trophies there behind you, do you, Sut? Let me tell you something. My pride and joy right now are my two grandkids, Dano. You I, know I'd still called. rather have an MVP or a World Series title, you know. You know, you can look behind Chipper tomorrow and see all of that crap. <laughs> I saw him on, on a Sunday night. It was like, oh, Chipper brought out the hardware just to remind people. Yeah, Hall of Famer. Yeah, it's a pretty decorated career. You know, I would do that. I could decorate all. Oh, first of all, all of our, all my stuff's back in Kansas City. But the problem is when, you know, I put up that Cy Young, everybody always throws a date with that. And when you hear 1984, <laughs> a lot of kids just shake their heads like, what? Wow. You're old. Uh, we'll be watching on Friday, Sut. Great to talk to you as always, and uh, our best to uh, Boog, uh, Boogs and uh, and Chipper. You know what? It's a different year, Dano. It's a different schedule. We've got different rules, but as you know, and you talk about it all the time, it's the same goal. You know, everybody wants to win that World Series, and I love what David Ross said the other night. He said, if they're giving out a ring, I want one. So. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Anytime, anything, anywhere, you know that, buddy. Thank you, bud. That's uh, Rick Sutcliffe, ESPN Baseball Analyst and Cy Young winner, uh, also Rookie of the Year as well.